passeth by a word with heaven comfort from. Good to see us all in uh, tonight. Trust you're all keeping well. Um, I want you to turn with me to a wee psalm. It's a very familiar psalm, I suppose, to many. Uh, it's Psalm 2, second psalm. If I'm strictly speaking, Psalm 2 and Psalm 1 are actually one psalm. They're actually one psalm uh, broken up. And very often you'll hear people preach on Psalm 1 and I'll talk about the blessed man. And you'll hear a lot of Christians talk about blessed is the man, you know, who doesn't sit in the council of the ungodly and stands in the way of sinners. And you often hear this being preached at youth meetings to say, you know, avoid bad company and you need to be someone who delights in the word of God and you need to be a person who's planted like the rivers of water and so on and so forth. But can I tell you something that might surprise you? Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 are about the same thing. And it's about a good, godly king. The figure of Psalm 1, the blessed man, is actually the divine king. And the idea of the divine king, by the way, is a man who doesn't receive bad counsel. He's a man that is meditating on the Torah. According to Deuteronomy 17, the, the sign of a good king was he meditated on the law of God. His rule and his administration was based upon the Ten Commandments and all the other commandments connected to it. And so what you read in, in Psalm 1 is about the blessed man, the good king. And it's interesting, Jesus fulfills all of those qualities. He was not found in the counsel of the ungodly. He didn't stand in the way of sinners. Uh, he was meditating on the word of God, the law of God, daily. And he was as a tree planted by the rivers of living water. Uh, in contrast, a bad king, it says the ungodly are not so. And that's very much the case. It says if you have an ungodly king, according to uh, Psalm 1, they don't live for very long. They don't survive long. And you often find that. It's important to say. Ungodly kingdoms and ungodly power structures always have a sell-by date on them. Always have a sell-by date. They never last. They always sort of boast and say we're here forever. And we are now taking the center stage and we're going to progress things. And now we've got power and we've got the wind in our sails. But according to the Bible, when an ungodly power stru uh, structure comes into place, it's like chaff. It'll be there for a wee while, but then it'll blow away. And so that's what you have to always understand when you interpret world events and even your own personal life at times. Evil has a sell-by date. It never lasts very long. It lasts for a little time, and then God says it must be blown away. It will not survive that long at all. But as I say, Psalm 1 is about the good king. And then Psalm 2 is, is really his coronation, which is very unusual. And it's basically the introduction to the whole book, which we call the Psalms, 150 of them in total. And these are two that are like the introductory gate. They're like two gate posts that you walk through as you look through the Psalms. And they basically give you all the wee details you need to know about the rest of the Psalms, which are about God's kingdom and what God's going to do through his kingdom. So let's read Psalm 2 together. And this is where it begins. Very unusual. It starts off with a question. It says, Why did the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? And the rulers of, to take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed or against his Messiah. Because Messiah just simply means anointed one. So it says, they say this, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. But here's the second picture that we're given. It says, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord, or Adonai, shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. So there's then the third picture you have. So we have three stanzas so far. The third picture is now the king speaking from his throne. The Messiah speaking from his throne. And it says in verse 7, I will declare the decree. Yahweh has said to me, you are my son. Today have I begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with the rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel and in the final stanza there verses 10 to 12 God then turns to the earth again he speaks to the rebellious nations and this is what he says now therefore be wise O kings 
be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little. And it says, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Interesting, if you look at the verse 12, it says, blessed is the man, or blessed is all those who put their trust in him. And then chapter 1, verse 1 starts with this. Blessed is the man. So it's a full circle. Going back to the idea of the ultimate blessing. God, not only does God bless individuals, it says in Psalm 1, he blesses nations in Psalm 2. So let's pray together and commit our wee time to the Lord this evening. And you can ask God to speak to your heart tonight. Father God, we thank you for the gift of your word, that it is full of life, it's full of truth, it's full of power. And as we open ourselves to the word, you've told us the entrance of your word brings light. And Father, we want to welcome more of the light of your word inside of us this evening. We don't want to live in darkness. We don't want to allow shadows into our lives. We don't want to live in anything other that you'll release greater spiritual light into our minds, into our hearts, into our spirit man tonight, Father. And that each one of us would leave this place, Lord God, with our hearts burning within us, not because, Lord, of any messages, but because, Lord, we've heard from you speaking to our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that your spirit will be pleased, Lord, just to build us up in the holy faith and strengthen us in every way possible. So, God, we do pray tonight for the power and the anointing of your Holy Spirit to give grace where there's weakness, to, Lord, cleanse us afresh, fill us afresh, and use us afresh. And we pray, Lord, for people to be helped and blessed tonight. We pray a wall of fire in this we place and bring everything under the dominion and authority of the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. And pray that, Lord, you will speak and, Lord, manifest your power in our midst, we pray now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What I want to talk to you about tonight for a short time is that Jesus will inherit the nations. And I'm talking about this primarily because I think we're living in a really low point for evangelicals and their faith. I'm not talking about their doctrine because they squeaky clean very often about their doctrine. They know what to say and they know not what to say. But at the same time, you go into the prayer meetings of most evangelical churches and the faith levels are hitting the floor. Really, people do not have an awful lot of faith to believe that God's able to do anything. Really, what they think is that God is basically counting down the final seconds before he hits the big apocalypse alarm and then the church is out of here. And that's what they're really doing. They're just saying, look, there's nothing going to happen at all. I heard a story this week of a man and he was a bright believing man of God, a man of prayer, a man of faith, alleged Christian. And the two began to sit down and talk. And this bright Christian says, I believe God for revival. I believe God's going to save. I believe God's going to work in Ireland. And the man turned to him in response and says, no, I wouldn't be too confident about that. And he says, the more that man talked, he says, I just felt like the life was being drained out of me. He was like a blinking spiritual vampire. He was just taking the life out of me every single time he opened his gob. And he says, I just had to get out of his company. And friends, you don't have to travel too far before you find people like that where their faith is just rock bottom. And you, see, you have to realize this in a sense. When people talk about, you know, they don't have faith, that's not true. What they have is their faith, but it's in a, in a wrong thing. So you speak to, like, classic example, speak to an atheist. An atheist is a person who does the faith. They do have faith, right? They have faith in science, for example. They have faith in, you know, their own personal experiences. They have faith in pain and the message of pain. They, they put their faith in philosophers and media personalities and books that they've read and philosophers. They've, they put their faith in a lot of things, but they refuse to put their faith in God. See what I mean? So there's no such thing as unbelief. Unbelief, yes, does exist because it's you know there. But strictly speaking, unbelief is that you've put faith in another reality, not in God who is the ultimate reality. So even for evangelical Christians, you go into a prayer meeting, is there much faith in the Lord? Is there much faith that God is about to move, even in a local church, uh, even in a family, even in whatever given situation you might find yourself in? Not often that's the case. Why? Because what Christians do is they put their faith in the negative conditions of the world. They said God can't move. Well, why? The world is too wicked. God cannot move because the devil is doing so much. God cannot move because, you know, people aren't interested. There's no curiosity in God, for example. We can't expect to move of God because these negatives are here. And so what we do is we put our faith in the negative and not in the positive. 
or let's say another reason why people don't have great faith in the church is because people look at the church. They look at the evangelical church, for example, and they'll say something like, uh, oh, our church is so small. Or they'll say, our church is so old. It doesn't have very many young people. Or, you know, our church is so dead. Or our church is so far from God. There's no power of God in it. There's no presence of God. And what we start to do is that we put faith, again, in what is not happening, as opposed to what God would like to do, and in believe in who the Lord is. So that is always the challenge for us. Never judge, never judge a, a gathering, a, a time in history, a circumstance, by any other condition except this one. Who is God in this situation? That's the only thing you have to reckon in a given time. You may go into a group of people and there is zero faith in the room. Zero faith. And the conditions are not particularly auspicious. But what you must do in that situation is ask yourself the question, who is the Lord in this given moment? And when you start to ask that, you start to realize, well, God can do anything. I was just talking to Hazel about it recently, being invited to a meeting. And to be honest, I didn't really have great expectations for anything happening in it. I went to this wee meeting and, you know, small gathering. And it wasn't maybe quite my style or whatever I was used to, but I just obliged. I did what I had to do. And that was okay. And I thought, well, right, I'm going to get home now. But what was to my surprise was that there was a person came to me and says, could you pray for me? Could you pray for me in a particular way? And I says, that's fine. We went out, we prayed with them. And they smiled and said, I feel really better. Thank you for praying with me. And you go home. And it's only a matter of months then later on, I heard somebody come to me and say, do you know that person you prayed for? They got a total breakthrough that night. Totally transformed their life. They're completely different after 10, 15 years of having this affliction. And God entered, entered their life and totally freed them from this problem. But the point, the point is this. I went to the meeting and says, there's nothing happening here. And I can actually have faith and great confidence. I can say, you know, almost thus saith the Lord, zero is happening in this gathering. But you see, friends, what we do is we reckon on man, but not on God. And we need to start looking at things, not through the lens of negativity, but you look through the lens of God. You look through that lens. And so, for example, if I was to take us back in time, the earlier Christians, let's say 100 years ago, the Christians of that generation were strong in faith. If an evangelist came to a gospel campaign in Northern Ireland, they had expectation that within the first week, there was going to be at least five or six people born again. They just believed that. If on the first week, there were not signs of conversion, the evangelist would have taken the pastor, the minister, or the elders aside and said, what's going wrong in your church? Because any other church we go to, we're seeing people getting saved in their 10s, their 20s, their 30s. What's wrong with you people? That was the expectation they had. They had put their faith in the Lord. It had been proven. It had been correct, you know, proven correct over time. And they sort of grew an expectation to say, well, this is normal. Whereas today, if you hold a gospel campaign and say, boy, it was a good turnout. There were 80 Christians in and one unsaved. Boy, it was a powerful mission. And I saw them and they fidgeted. I saw them they were in the meeting and they fidgeted. They must be under conviction. No, they're just uncomfortable in your sort of rocky seats. You know, that's, that's what's happening, you know, let alone the rocky preaching, I don't know. But the fact is that all these folk, you know, have, our expectations are so low. But, you know, take, I'll give you a couple of examples. Like, one day there was a man came to Spurgeon, a young preacher came to Charles Spurgeon, and he said, Mr. Spurgeon, he says, I have a problem. He says, every time I go to preach, nobody gets his, but do you expect God to do anything? He says, no, I don't. He says, that's your problem. He says, expect God to move. And God will move. Spurgeon used to climb up the, the, the spiral staircase to his pulpit. And you could have heard him muttering under his lips. He says, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. He stood up before thousands of people trembling. Very rarely did he have notes. And he stood up and he would preach. And he would trust in the power of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes he would get up to preach. And he would get a three-point sermon just there and then. He wouldn't know what he was about to preach on. But God would fill him and give him a message there for the people. And people would be lining up Monday mornings round the block of his house coming to see him to give their lives to Christ. Half six in the morning on a Monday morning. He believed in the Holy Spirit. He expected God to move. Why would you, why would you for instance, I mean, why would you go and do any form of ministry in God's name or any form of church work or whatever and not expect God to work? I mean, for goodness sake, I mean, you, know, you went to, for instance, if you were a fisherman and you went down to the river with your fishing rod in hand and you plunk it in the water there, and a man comes to you and says, 
You expect me to catch much? No. No, I'm just, to be honest, when you meet most men like that in nature, they're saying, I'm getting away from her indoors. That's typically the answer you'll get. So yes, he is happy for some reasons, right? But if you said to him, do you, do you expect to get anything? No. Or you go and speak to a wee woman going around Tesco, are you getting groceries today? No, I'm just not expecting to get anything today. I'm just here with the trolley. I like just the feel of the trolley and just take it for a walk. You see what I mean? You would say that's absurd. And you're rightly laughing. That's absurd behavior. And yet you go to churches and you go week in and week out, week in and week out, and people say, do you expect God to move? No. We're going to God's house. Do you expect God to be there? No. Do you expect God to save anybody? No. And then they have a gospel campaign up the road and somebody gets saved and says, boy, there, there must, be some, must be the devil up there. I heard someone got healed up there. It must be the devil. I mean, that's how absurd it gets. I was reading, I was thinking about it today, actually. It was about a man, it was 100 years back. And he was a Pentecostal missionary to Africa. And he really felt the Lord was calling him into the mission field. And do you know what they said to him? And he found such an interesting thing they, they give him as advice. They didn't say to him, go you to a Bible college there and study. Or go there and study how to do mission, missionology or whatever. They said to the man, if you're going to go and be a missionary in Africa, you go and lead 10 people to the Lord in your hometown before you go anywhere near Africa. And when you lead 10 people to the Lord, we expect you to go and lead 20 people to the Lord in your local church. I mean, that sifted it, didn't it? But the man in turn was led by the Holy Spirit. He says, Lord, if you call me to Africa, he says, you're going to have to give me fruit here on, you know, England where he was from. And so that's what God did. You see, friends, you know, we need to actually build our faith out of this, this dunghill that we've built and actually start to trust God and say, wait a minute, I don't care what the evangelical church is like. You know, for example, I could walk into a refrigerator and still believe the sun is hot. Breezes, you know, those deep... Um, refrigerators they have in those hotels and all. And you could walk about and say, boy, it's minus 20 in here. doesn't mean that the whole planet's minus 20. You know that. You can actually believe that the sun is out there and it's shining even though I'm stuck here. And that's what you have to do. Faith reckons on one condition alone. Who is God? That's all that matters. Who is God? And if there's a second condition, what is God doing? Jesus said, I'm always doing what the Father's doing. The Father's always working. Whatever I see the Father do, that's what I do. Jesus could go into Galilee, which was a demonic hell of demonism, full of occultic stuff. And Jesus could see the power of God working in Galilee. Why? Because his eyes was on the Father. That's all he was looking at. Jesus could go into the middle of Jerusalem with all the theological heavyweights, all the Pharisees, all dusty men with cobwebs hanging off them. And Jesus could go into that atmosphere and he could prophesy, he could speak what God had told him to say, he could do miracles, he could do all those things. And boys put up his nose and says, we don't agree with that. And Jesus says, the Father is working and so I work. Faith doesn't require people. It really doesn't. And I think we need to elevate that out. Take the excuses out and just trust God. Just trust God for who he is. What we read off here tonight is Psalm 2. And I love Psalm 2 because this whole psalm is a gateway to the rest of the Psalms, but I would call it this. It's the gateway to faith and praise. That's how I would interpret Psalm 2. The whole Psalm is full of, of faith. And, and it's basically full of faith that God is about to move. And that's why the, the rest of the Psalms are all about praise. Because you only praise whenever you see God work. It's very, very static whenever you go to a meeting and people are just saying, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. But there's nothing of God in the gathering. God's not working. God's not working in the person's life. And so it just feels so recorded. You could actually take a tape recorder out and just play whatever, you know, last week's bit of worship was because it's the same tone. But whenever God's working in your life and whenever God's working in a group of people, the praise and the worship comes very fresh, very quickly. A new song is released because God's doing a new thing. And so that's what you find here in Psalm 2. There's this faith that's sort of bubbling out of, the, out of the verses. And then in turn, there's this praise that's beginning to mount up as well. And it's going to launch out to the rest of the 148 Psalms that you have there in the collection. So that's what you're getting here. But what is so interesting is the nations and they're fighting against God. You have all this chaos, all of this warlike language happening. And life it looks very negative. And yet the whole psalm is full of God laughing. It's full of God decreeing and declaring. 
It's where God at the very end of the psalm turns the tables on the nations and says, hey guys, this is the ultimatum. It's my way or the highway. This is a situation where faith is just completely comfortable in God in the face of great negatives, great opposition, great reasons to deny that the Lord is working. That's not what you need to see. It's a completely different perspective on the whole thing. Just to give you a wee bit of detail on it, because it is interesting. Psalm 2 is a coronation psalm. And what I mean by a coronation, we've watched maybe coronations, the British coronations and things like that. But to give you the basic points of it, a crown is placed upon the head of the king. That's basic. Second thing is they anoint him with oil. And then the third thing, they give him a document or a pledge or like an agreement or an oath between God and the king. And all three elements you find are written here in Psalm 2. So there's obviously a crown placed on his head because it says today you're begotten, you've become uh, a king. That's what the idea of being the son is in this particular psalm, you're the king. He's called the anointed, which means he has anointing on him. And then he also is given a decree or a document or a covenant. And so the king is given all these various things. As you may know, and you may already have this in your mind, but Psalm 2 is about Jesus. It's prophetically about Jesus. Yes, it was probably written originally about Solomon or some descendant of King David, but ultimately it is applied in the New Testament to Jesus himself. Psalm 2 is the second most popular psalm in the New Testament. The first one is Psalm 110. But both of them are declaring that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings. That's what you need to understand with that all. So let's go through this this evening. And I want to really just put to death defeatism, negative thinking. And I want you to leave this place tonight with a renewed faith in your heart that says, I believe that Jesus Christ is able to save. I believe that Jesus Christ is not only able to save individuals, but he's able to save nations. He's able to move in great ways. There's no denying the power of the Lord in those areas. So let's look at a couple of wee things tonight. Four wee things, look at each four uh, tonight, okay? Let's look at the first one here, verses one to three. This is what I would call defiance. Defiance. And look here where it starts. Why do the nations rage? Here's the psalmist commencing his uh, psalm and he just starts with a question. He's not confused, by the way. He's not looking for an answer. But it's more like bafflement. The psalmist is standing here looking at the nations and he's rightly confused as to why they're doing this. Basically he's saying, why are you guys so stupid? You, you're going for this, but it's not going to work. You, you don't realize this is going to have a negative outcome. By the way, what this is referring to is during the times when kings would transfer power, let's say from David to Solomon, that transitional period was typically the weakest point of a kingdom because there's nobody in control. And so very often Edom or Moab or Ammon or some other sort of regional neighbor state, they would take that opportunity to rebel. And that's what the nations are here in Psalm 2 and verse 1. They're rebelling during that transition. Just before the, the king should be crowned, they're wanting to cause all this trouble. But I want you to notice a couple of wee things about it. The psalmist, whenever he's about to look at this negative scene, is not despairing. He is not baffled in the sense of, oh, I've lost all hope, I don't know what to trust in, I don't know what to believe in. Where is God in this? No, not at all. Here is a man that's looking at the negative problem straight on, but he has such confidence in God that he says, this is so ridiculous. You know, for example, how many Christians do you meet who feel intimidated when they come across atheism? Or they meet the local, you know, atheist who's giving off stink about something and they feel immediately intimidated. Whereas Psalm 2 says, why, why are these people doing dumb stuff? Whenever you look at society and it's saying, we don't want God, we don't want to follow God, that you would almost think, well, Christians are in the minority and we feel then we should just sort of, you know, just retire to our own wee, wee cupboards there and don't let anybody know that we're there. But that's not the psalmist. The psalmist is looking at this phenomena and he says, this is ridiculous. This is completely ridiculous. Why? Because he's not putting his faith in the clamor of man, the opposition of man, but instead he's put it in the Lord. He sees it from heaven's perspective, not earth's perspective. And from that enlightened stance, He's able to exercise faith in this and said, this is going to blow away. This is not going to survive. 
But let's look at these people for a wee second. Let, let's blind, as it were, ourselves to God, okay, a little second. Let's just focus on what these people are at. Let's, let's throw ourselves into the midst of this crowd as they begin to talk. Look at these verses. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast their cords from us. I want to look at three wee things there. Let's look at this first. Their attitude. Let's look at their attitude here. You have it in verse 1. It says they rage. They rage. They're, they're full of anger. They're full of anger. The actual word in Hebrew is rachesh. It has the idea of a horse that's snorting, chomping at the bit like a war horse ready to go into battle. It's, it's speaking of this real pent-up anger that's, that's reached the surface and is about to blow at any minute. It's this sort of anger that you see that's prominent today in at least popular media. Where anything about Jesus or God is mentioned and just immediately there you have this, this great storm of opposition rising up against it. It's this idea of mention God and we're going to shoot you down. You mention God, we're going to say you're an idiot. You mention God, you're going to be a bigot. You mention God, we'll sideline you, we'll cancel you, we'll do all those things. It's anger. It's, it's just, I'm ready on the tack. I'm ready to pounce on you. That's what the rage means here. And it says furthermore there in their attitude of verse 9, has the idea of meditating. It's the same word, by the way, that's used in chapter 1, or Psalm 1 here, and verse 2. It says, the man, he meditates on God's law night and day. So the idea is that these people are thinking and plotting all the time. And this is filling their heart, it's filling their minds. And, and this is, they're full of it. They're full of this stuff, okay? It's a hatred of God. If you go on there to their actions in verse 2, it says the kings of the earth set themselves. The word therefore set literally means to deploy in battle formation. They have deployed themselves ready for a fight. They're ready for a scrape. They're ready for an attack on God. They're ready for it. They have drew up their plans. They have gathered all together. And they said, we're going to launch an attack on God. We're going to do with God. God's out of the picture. That's what they're thinking, okay? You go a wee bit further there in verse 2. The rulers take counsel together. So there's like a wisdom. This seems very clever. This seems very intricate. This seems very persuasive and very logical, rational even. They have counsel, they have wisdom. So they take it together and it's against God. So it's an anti-God logic or an anti-God reasoning. And it's against anything to do with Christ. And this is what their ambition is then in verse 3. They said, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Literally, the, these kings of these other nations said, we want done with Israel. Israel will not rule over us. Israel's God will not rule over us either. But if you look at these words here, it says break their bonds. The word for bonds or regulations. And of course, when you think of Israel, Israel's law was God's word. That's what they got their law from. It was the word of God. So here is a group of people that says, we want to break God's law from off us. We want freedom from this law. That's what they're saying. And it says there in verse 3 as well, and let us cast away the cords. Another way of putting that is the yoke. Like an oxen is put under the yoke. And so here is the people says, we will not have the law of God and we will not have the yoke of God placed upon us. It just reminds you what Jesus said. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. So here's a people, when you think of it, it's really absurd. They said, let's cast off the yoke of Jesus Christ. And let's put on ourselves a heavier yoke. When you take, for example, the sort of woke culture. Woke culture is all about judgment, but there's no mercy. If you step out of line, you're judged. You step out of line, you're not in our group any longer. You're a pariah. You're an outsider. It's a heavy yoke. You can't live under it. In a secular world, I was thinking of it this week, in a secular world where everybody can do what they want, Everybody can do and fulfill their heart's desire. In a secular world, there is no forgiveness. At least a serious forgiveness. You can nod your head and say, oh, I'm forgiven or whatever. You say, I don't believe there's even a thing called guilt or sin or all those things. I need to be the true version of me. But you find deep down in the human consciousness, there's a desire for the freedom of guilt. There's a desire for real forgiveness. And you can't get that in a secular godless world. You can't get it. Only Jesus can offer that forgiveness to people. 
And that's what hearts are looking for. But if I was to take these things together and give you even a broader picture, a spiritual picture, so to speak, of what's happening here in verses 1 to 3. If I was to describe to you the nations, I'm referring to people, to the people themselves. So the people are full of rage. They say, we don't want God. We don't want anything to do with God. We want to do our own thing. Even if you take verse 3, I thought it was interesting. They say, let us break. And I was reminded of Genesis 126, whenever God said, let us make. So we are not living in the generation that honors the Lord who says, let us make man in our, in his, in, in, in our own image. But this is the generation that says, let us break anything of the image of God off us. We don't want that. Here's the nation, the people. But then you mention the kings here. And let's understand it through the lens of the New Testament. The kings here, I would dare suggest, are the principalities and the powers, the spiritual forces in heavenly places that are pushing and agitating and trying to lead people in rebellion against God. Here you have the spirit of Antichrist in operation. So all of this is happening, right? So verses 1 to 3 is just basically your newspaper on a Monday morning. It's looking at anything in the news online. It's basically anything in your media. It's anything in your culture. Verses 1 to 3 is just defiance to God. So here's the question then. Can God work in this situation? If the people are saying, we don't want God, and and they're in allegiance with demonic powers, and they're saying, we don't want anything to do with God, we will break his yoke, we will defy his laws, we do not want him to rule over us, we will do our own. If you have the average evangelical say, no. The only thing that God's going to do is rapture us out of this thing, and we're just going to have to bunker it out and buy our baked beans until we get there. I mean, that's, that's the men's mindset of many believers. It's just we're going to believe things are going to get worse and we're not going to believe God can work in that. That's why the second stanza here is so, so fascinating. It shifts from earth into heaven. <laughs> and here we have what I would call derision. So you would be looking at this scenario, verses 1 to 3, panicking, fearful, in trepidation about, oh God, we're going to be wiped out. The church is going to be no more within a generation or two, whatever. And, and that's the fear factor kicking in. What do you find God is doing up in heaven? According to verses 4 and onwards. He who sits in the heavens laughs. He says, boy, you've tickled me on that one. <laughs> you're going to cast off my laws. You're going to renounce me. You're going to break all this stuff. And you're, you're full of hype and you're full of all that stuff. Sit down and settle down there. Go and settle your head. That's the sort of idea that God has. He just says, this is so pathetic. (laughs) This is so silly. This is so ridiculous that you guys would actually think this. Seriously. The Lord there, it says there in verse 4, the one who sits, and the term there is, sits as king. Isn't it interesting, friends, that the whole world tonight could become atheist, but it doesn't move God an inch off his throne. The whole world tonight could parade through the streets and say, we do not want anything to do with God and his word about how we live our lives. But friends, God still sits on that throne because no man put him on that throne. Right, and his own righteousness. He sits on that throne because he's entitled to sit on that throne. And no man, no power of hell, no allegiance of demons and men will ever overthrow the kingdom of God. I was reading about it in the book of Daniel. There's the wee minority Christian, so to speak, the minority believers. Daniel and his wee friends. And there they have these great powers and and they say, we don't believe in your God. We don't want anything to do with your God. Friends, this is not new what we're living in. This is not something that has just happened in the 21st century. Although our society tells us this is the 21st century, guys, get with the agenda. This has happened over thousands of years of history. This Psalm 2, by the way, is 3,000 years old. They were still raging against God 3,000 years ago, but guess who's still God? So go back to Daniel there. Daniel says, I'm not going to trust trust in God. There he is, 70, 80 years of age, trusting, praying in God. And they said, you're not doing what society tells you to do, Daniel. He says, well, I just pray to God three times a day. And they say, well, we're going to throw you in the lion's den. They throw an 80-year-old man from a deep drop. He should die on impact. He should just become basically crumpled bones in a matter of seconds and then get munched by lions. And yet, isn't it amazing? There's a man that came out of that place and God rescued him. God spurred his life. God was able to move supernaturally. And at the end of it, even the king says, the the kingdom of your God, Daniel, is an everlasting kingdom that will never be destroyed. Isn't that what you need to believe? 
We are part of a kingdom that will never be shaken. I mean, I laugh at Isaac. The BBC can be shaken. You know, Sky News can be shaken. The British Parliament can be shaken. NHA, all these things that people think are staples, they're not staples of human life. They are shakable. But the thing that is unshakable is a prayer meeting full of the power of God. With men believing God. And if you're kingdom up to the neck, friends, you're unshakable. As D.L. Moody says, you're immortal until you do the will of God. That's the attitude you need to have. It's the same attitude Jesus had when he stood before Pontius Pilate. Pilate says, don't you realize you have the power to take your life? I can kill you in an instant. And Jesus says, you have no power but what my father gives you. He wasn't expecting that as an answer, was he? But it's a good answer. So what you find, friends, is this Psalm 2. It just talks about, look, look at it from heaven's perspective. God looks at the whole thing and he laughs at it. He says, you're like little ants batting your head against a mountainside. You will not win. This does not work. And you have to understand that through human history, there are phases of, of, of rebellion. There are phases of apostasy. There are phases of defiance against God. But they're only phases. And one of the most powerful weapons that you have in the kingdom of God is patience. Is patience. They said at Winston Churchill, it took a long time to be an overnight success. And there's a lot of truth to that. In other words, that, that everything was going wrong in, in, in Britain at that time. But there was old Winnie, you know, plugging away until such times as I said, look, we're really embarrassed to ask you of all people to come and help us here. But he had been prepared. Even his own biography says it felt as if the hand of God had been on my life preparing me for this moment. And friends, what you have to understand is this. Are you kingdom people? Are you wanting to live for the kingdom of God and its righteousness? Not just lip service to God. Not just like the average evangelical Christian say, Oh yes, God, we love God. We love the Lord. Let's sing praises. Let's read our Bibles. And all. But when it comes to real obedience, they don't want to do it. They don't want to surrender their lives completely. They don't want to be full of the Holy Spirit. They're happy with things as they are. They're happy to live as exiles in Babylon and become Babylonian. But friends, if you're like Daniel and if you're like these other men throughout Scripture... They recognized things were wrong, but they had patience and faith in God. And they said, God, we're still loyal to you. And we believe that in time, you're going to turn this thing around. And we're going to be ready and prepared for that moment. Whenever the culture falls apart, we're ready there to rebuild. We've been trained for generations to, to know exactly what to say in this given moment of time. That's what the Christian church should be doing right now. Instead, what it is, is, is building bunkers and panicking and trying to build wee empires for themselves. And it's just a waste of time. Get into the kingdom. Seek God's kingdom. Pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Pray for the power of God, for holiness, for purity. To love Jesus with all our hearts. Pray for those things. Look for those things. And if those are the passions of your heart, you're beginning to be a culture shaper. So, that's what you read here. It says in verse 4, He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. So, listen to this here. God is sitting there, and it says he's laughing to himself. Isn't that wonderful? Atheism is God's sense of humor. <laughs> really, humanism is God's sense of humor. Yeah, pull another one. That's a good one, isn't it? You know, the absurdity of a man that can look at the complexity of the human eye and says, this happened completely by chance. To look at the complexity of the human body and how all these intricate systems work together, even down to the DNA system, and to say, yeah, it just happened over millions of years, trial and error. Yeah, yeah, that's what we believe. Yes, that's God's sense of humor. But even it says here, and this might shock us as well. See that says when it says in verse 4, the Lord shall have them in derision. The word there in Hebrew is the idea of throwing one's head back and mocking someone. You're an idiot. <laughs> that's basically, you're an idiot. You're a gold-plated, 24-carat plated numpty. You are completely and utterly out of your head and you don't know what you're talking about. Sit down, shut up, because somebody important is going to talk. You know, that's, that's basically the attitude of the Lord towards these people. But notice as well, now this is important then to note in verse 5. It says that yes, the Lord had a laugh over what's happening. But in verse 5 he says, then he shall speak to them. Who are the them? In this case I believe the kings are the demonic rulers of the age. And the people are the nations that are in rebellion against him. What does God have to say to them? He shall speak to them in his wrath. And distress them in his deep displeasure. Now this is something we need to take on board. 
Men may have an anger against God. That should not worry us. But what we need to be more concerned about is when God is angry with men. That's more concerning. And we need to reclaim and redeem that truth in our theology even. as wrath of God is good. Many Christians say, oh no, they either preach the wrath of God because they hate the human race and want everybody to die in hell fire. Or they're so nice to everybody they wouldn't dare even suggest God would ever punish sin. We believe that God is good. And because he is good, he's going to rid the world of everything that is abhorrent. From mass murder down to white lies, he's going to deal with everything. Because he's so holy. We live in a world that is so completely corrupted that we've become so sympathetic to it. Actually, the man lied, or the man lusts, or the man, you know, was proud or something. And we just say, oh yeah, that's normal. But if you live in a heavenly perspective, that is abnormal. I mean, one of the words that Jesus uses for sin in the New Testament, it's a Greek word, scandalon. It's the word scandal. When heaven looks at sin, we shrug our shoulders and say, oh, live and let live. Everybody, we're only human. All of legs of clay at the end of the day, don't we? But heaven and angels would tell you what they think. They say, it is a scandal. What is done? It is a scandal. It is the shock of heaven. And they can feel the anger of the Lord against that behavior. And even those who, who participate in that behavior. So you understand, friends, we need to get closer to the heart of God. Yes, we can laugh at absurdities, but at the same time we grieve over people who are doing these things because they're entering into judgment. Now, this is what's unusual. Whenever God laughs and whenever God is angry, it says this is what he wants the nations to know and the principalities and powers to know as well. It says in verse 6, Yet I have set my king... It says, on my holy hill of Zion. I love this idea. I read it in a wee comment recently. It says, Jesus is a threefold king. He is God's king. He is his people's king. And he is his enemy's king. Jesus is God's king, his people's king, and his enemy's king as well. He's the king of all things because God has set him up there. So whenever God wants to bring everything back into perspective. And whenever God wants to bring righteousness to the world and punish evildoing, what does he do? He designates and anoints his son and sets him on the throne of heaven. He descended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father. It was for the express purpose of bringing order, perspective, and a new reality into planet earth. And on top of it, he would rid the world of evil. Whether that's through people getting saved and they repent and they turn from evil, and he wipes out evil in an instant. But the appointment of God's son on his throne is the response that God has to the nations that rise against him. So this is what you need to understand tonight, friends, is although the nations rise and although the powers of this age rise against God and we're living in such an era now, Jesus Christ is still on that throne of glory. And he's still in operation on that throne of glory for 2,000 years. And he's not intimidated one bit. Neither should the people of God be. If we live in the throne room, we imbibe the very atmosphere of that throne room. We're not intimidated. We can laugh, but we also grieve. And we see it as it really is. Let's look at this third one then, the decree. Now this is so interesting. This is what should give us great faith tonight. The father is laughing, but he's also grieved and he's angered at the sin of the nations. Now we have Jesus beginning to speak. And this is so interesting. This is the decree. Now the decree is a document that's given. Now I want to explain this before we even read it. The decree given back to the king on his coronation was a document between God and the king. It was a covenant that God says, I will do this for you. But you must fulfill this on my behalf. So here is Jesus. Like, get this picture in your head. He has died. He has been buried. He has rose again. He now ascends into the right hand of the Father. He is approaching the throne of God. And as just about as he sits down on that throne, the Father gives Jesus this personal word of covenant. This decree that the Father has given to the Son. And the Son will fulfill this decree. Listen to what it says in verse, six, or verse 7 here. I will declare the decree, Jesus says. So picture it, Jesus in front of millions of angels, in front of the redeemed saints of the Old Testament, in front of principalities and powers. Maybe this is what he declared when he went down into hell, I don't know. But this is what he declares. And this is what heaven still declares tonight. 
It says, the Lord has said to me, you are my son, today have I begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. That is what Jesus Christ proclaimed in heavenly places and that is what he proclaims over the earth right now. That's amazing. If I was to break this down for us in simple terms, verse 7 talks about today. uses that word today. Obviously we think of it as a time reference. Probably this is the moment whenever Jesus did ascend into heaven and that was the day. But you have to understand this, this in, in the Old Testament. Very often when God made a covenant with Israel, he says today. So in Deuteronomy he says, today I set before you life and death. He always used that in covenant language. Even in the book of Hebrews, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. It's the language of covenant and I want to really convey that to you. This is strong legal language which God will not retract nor God will deny. This is binding on the earth. This is binding in heaven. So whenever we read these words, we ought to tremble. When we read these words, we ought to realize we're standing upon holy ground in which God himself will fulfill and which Jesus himself has spoken in heaven above. And whenever we pray these words, we are praying the kingdom of God to come on earth. That's how serious this is. Jesus, it says, has been begotten. What that is a term just simply means, it means crowned as king. In the ancient world, the son of God was a term given to kings because the assumption was God was their father. So Jesus is crowned as king. If we take it another way, Jesus is begotten from the grave. He's declared to be God's son. He was always God's son, but he's declared it at the resurrection. And so here's Jesus sitting down at the father's right hand. And listen to what it says there in verse 8. Jesus has been promised the nations. And he will receive each nation to himself. Ireland is in verse 8. If you want to be political, Northern Ireland's in it. The Republic of Ireland is in it. I don't care. Ireland's in it. It says Jesus asks for the nations. Do you think the Father is going to say no to him? Not at all. The Father is going to say yes. But take it, on, take it to your mind, friend. These are the same nations full of rage and anger that don't want him, that want to fight against him, that are in yoke with demonic powers. What nation could possibly submit to Jesus Christ? But Jesus says, I'm asking for them and I'm going to get them. That's what you need to get. He's the end, I could even say the end of the world for your possession. Take it not a question of geography, but time, chronology. Will Jesus Christ receive saints from the 5th century? He already has. Will Jesus Christ receive saints from the 17th century? He has. Will Jesus Christ receive saints from the 21st century? You bet he's going to get them. Doesn't matter the time. Doesn't matter the place. Doesn't matter the circumstances. He is king. He is Lord. He's in covenant with his father. And he's going to get the nations to himself. And we ought to pray, therefore, ask, we want to ask, Lord, give Jesus the nations. Give him Ireland. Give him the counties of Ireland. Give him towns. Give him communities. Give him the whole jolly lot. Give him everything. That's what you need to think. So why should you be despondent? I was reading something yesterday. It really thrilled me. I thought it was brilliant. I never knew this. But supposedly in Spain, there are two pillars that were erected 2,000 years ago by a Roman emperor called Diocletian. Diocletian famously persecuted the Christians. But on these pillars, do you know what he's put on them? I think this is awesome. He says, I, Diocletian, have rid the world of the superstition of Jesus Christ. I have rid the world of any mention of Christ and his followers. I have got rid of them. Here's a survey. How many people in this room have heard of Jesus Christ? But who's heard of Diocletian? See what I mean? And yet if you lived in the days of Diocletian, you'd say, boy, he's really a mover and shaker. Sure, the whole, for the whole empire is turning against Jesus. I mean, it's pretty rough to be a Christian. But 2,000 years later, Jesus triumphs. Do you believe that Jesus Christ will triumph in 2024 for what remains of it? Do you believe he'll triumph in 2025? But the scripture says, thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Why should we be going about sad sacks complaining? But I see rejoice in the Lord and say, no, he has the victory. I don't know how he's going to, going to win this battle. We're going to trust in him and he's going to do it for us. So it says he will win the nations to himself. Verse 9 says, when it comes to resistance and opposition, 
and the powers of darkness fighting and trying to stop this great nationwide and global outreach of Jesus. What does it say there? Jesus will break them with a rod of iron. And it says he will dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. I, I tell you what happened recently. I was stupid enough one morning I went to get my breakfast. And I went and got my wee bowl and was half dopey, half whatever it was. And I picked it up and here didn't it chip the side of this wee thing. And I says, I better not mention that to Hazel. But <laughs> only last week, he's, this thing was chipped. This thing was chipped. And I says, it was me. That's <laughs> what to do me. My point being, inadvertently he could chip that because it's so fragile. I wasn't there with a big rod of iron. I was just there being clumsy with cornflakes. But friends, isn't it amazing? The Bible says that Jesus takes this rod of iron. And there's the enemy standing in front. We defy you. We stand in opposition to you, Jesus. Clear off. This is our territory. Jesus says, you're but china in front of me. You're but fragile pots in front of me. I'll break you to shreds. And yet we say, oh, the enemy's doing this. The enemy's doing that. The enemy. Friends, the enemy's walking about with a big glass head on him. And Jesus has a pound mallet in his hand. Who's going to win? You know what I mean? If we take it into real perspective... There's a certain faith that should rise in your heart to say, he's got this. And if we face the enemy, yes, there's an enemy. Yes, he does dirty tricks. Yes, he makes your life miserable at times. But we have a savior that crushes the head of the enemy. Yeah. I mean, isn't that what it's about? I believe in the power of God, not in the power of the devil. I prefer to believe in the power of God rather than the power of Satan. So that's what it says, he's going he's to win this. That's the decree of Jesus. But let's look at this final wee thing here. And that is due to his dominion. That he will win the nations to himself. Look what it says now. You would expect in this situation. The nations are rising against Jesus. The father laughs but he's angry at what's going on. Jesus has been crowned king. And now he's been given this decree and he declares the decree. You would expect it's going to be red hot judgment from that moment onwards. And yet verses 10 to 12 takes a very dramatic turn. Because what God does is he comes to meet the nations in all their rage and bluster and hatred and all the things they have and God offers them mercy. He offers them an alternative, an ultimatum. Whenever they deserve to be wiped out in a single blink of an eye, Jesus comes and it says here in verse 10, he speaks to the nations and he tells them to do four things. He says, he says therefore be wise. O kings, you're behaving foolishly. You need to be wise. He says secondly to them, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Be teachable. He says there in verse 11, serve the Lord. It means to submit to the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. And then fourthly, kiss the son, which was a sign of loyalty. You would kiss the royal ring or you'd kiss the feet of the monarch. And it was a sign that you were his subject. Jesus says to the nations, come and make peace with me. I have the rod of iron in my hand. I can wipe the nations out in an instant. But I come to you in gentleness. I come to you in meekness. I come to you in love. I come to you in mercy. And I say, I hold back. Like in Isaiah it says, with one hand he holds back his wrath. And with his hand it's still stretched out. And he calls the nations to himself. He says, come to me. Isn't it amazing that Ireland tonight has been the most defiant, ignorant nation? When you consider this evening that our uh, Irish nation has murdered children, was a generation ago they wouldn't have done that? When you consider that the British Parliament or British Prime Minister has said, if the, if the Israeli Prime Minister sets foot in this country, that Jewish leader is going to go into prison? You, take a, you think about how many, how many dumb decisions does the British and Irish leadership and the British and Irish people have to make to toy with God any further it's like what Jim McConnell used to say every day a sinner wakes up and says come on God hit me with it come on defying God every day playing chicken with God every day and God says no I'm not playing your game I'm offering you serious mercy serious forgiveness serious salvation do you want it or do you not and that is what God is doing in a really powerful way in the earth right now. What is wonderful when you think about your life and mine. We were playing this game of chicken with God. And yet God was merciful to us. And he stopped us and says, 
Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And God saved us. Brought us into his kingdom. And the crux of what I'm saying to us tonight is this, friends. Do you believe that the same God who saved you can save men and women now? <laughs> you run impossibility. You realize that you run impossibility. To, to anybody looking at you, that says, that man or that woman will never get saved. But guess what happened? He got saved. <laughs> so the fact is, is the arm of the Lord shortened that he cannot save? When you consider that we've got a, what, a series of meetings this next weekend, can the Lord Almighty save in great numbers? He can do it. He doesn't need a meeting. He doesn't need an evangelist. He doesn't need anything. He can just save people there and then. I loved participating in a mission two years ago. And a man got saved when they went to his house and said, can we, uh, our, our wee tent mission here needs a bit of water for our boilers for the cups of tea. Could we use your water? And the man got saved because the man went and asked him for water and opened a conversation. Didn't go to the mission. So friends, the point is like, the Lord is able to do so much. Take the limits off. Take this breaks off. Take these restraints that we put on the Lord and just say, wait a minute. This is the Jesus who says the nations are his. If the nations are his, what about villages? What about towns? What about cities? What about counties? What about families for dear sake? What about anybody for that matter? When you think of the power, the mercy, the love, the wisdom of Jesus, you just say he's able to save anybody. Why should I doubt him? Why should I hold on to any bit of unbelief inside of my heart when I think of who he is? That's why this we psalm ends in verse 12. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. The gospel is not a complex message. It does say to men bad news. It tells them they're sinners. It tells them they're lost. It tells them they're under the judgment of God. But the solution is very simple. It says you must trust completely in Jesus Christ. Do you know what I've been thinking in recent weeks? I think we need to really preach a message, not of just... You can say to a man, oh, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do that for you, buddy. I'll do all right. And then they're back in the pub. But if you explain to a man or woman, this is not just, oh, I believe in Jesus that he exists. It's loyalty. It's like when you get married, you are not saying, I got married to this girl and then I play the time. It doesn't work like that. You are there. You are one and you're one flesh with that woman, and you're not with anybody else. That's as simple as it is. And we must say to men and women, you have Christ, and you have Christ alone. No other hope, no other addition, no other supplement. Christ and Christ alone. And your loyalty is to him. Because if we miss that, we've, we've brought, brought up a generation of people in confirmation, and, and, and just raising hands in meetings, and signing wee cards, and all. And they say, I believe in Jesus, but sure, I don't really be loyal to Jesus. No, if you believe, you're faithful. That's always the sign of a believer. They're faithful to the Lord. So the night, friends, what I want us to do, I want us to really take a moment here, just burn our heads, and I want you to really get shot of all unbelief out of your heart. I don't, I don't know where, you, if you've picked it up, throw it back wherever you got it. If you've sat down under bad teaching and you've just listened under just stuff that's got your head full of wee white mice and you're believing nonsense and you just don't believe what the Lord's able to do, get rid of that bad theology and pick up the Bible. Um, but whatever that is, whatever that implement is, or whatever that impediment, sorry, is, just get rid of it. And, and let's rise in fresh faith to say, our Savior is able to save. He's able to heal. He's able to deliver. He's able to win not only individuals, but he's able to win a nation back to himself. Ireland is wee buns to him. Ireland is such an easy prize for him to take. As a dear friend years ago when he had a wee prophetic vision, and he just said, I saw Jesus, as it were, sitting on the circle of the earth. And he just says, whenever he, the lion, would look at a nation, the nation would just begin to erupt into spiritual flames of life. He didn't have to say anything, he just looked at it. What is the power of Jesus tonight? So Lord, as we are here this evening, we just want to really take on this, this unbelief, even this evangelical, even this theological unbelief. And we want to pray, Lord, those mindsets of doubt, those mind, mindsets of double-mindedness, those mindsets of, of, of just disbelief or unbelief or refusal to believe, whatever iteration it is, we just want to tear down those imaginations tonight in Jesus' name. We want to pray tonight, Lord, that you would tear down every single stronghold of the enemy when it comes to unbelief. And Lord, if there's anything of the powers of darkness behind that, we put the cross between the people and the enemy now in Jesus' name. 
And we just pray those assignments of doubt and unbelief, whether from media, whether from experience, whether from teaching, whatever it has come through, we shut those doors down now in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, for your people, each of us tonight. Fill us with fresh faith. Fill us with the fresh faith of heaven tonight. That, Lord, as the angel says, yep, God's going to do it. The saints in heaven says, yep, God's going to do it. Lord, and yet here we are on earth saying, well, I don't know if God will do it. Lord, we just want to pray, let it be done on earth as it is in heaven tonight. Give us the faith, like old Wesley said, that can take the mountain and, Lord God, bring it to a plain. Give us the childlike praying love that longs to see thy love us. Like leaven in, in a batch of dough. Just fill us full of faith that we're overflowing in it. Lord, we ask you graciously, Father, tonight, would you give this house, Lord God, a fresh dousing of faith. Just let the place be, Lord, like a power hose at this time of year. Lord, would you power hose this house with faith. That, Lord, the whole thing is just shining with faith. It says we believe God. It doesn't matter what it is, we believe God. And so the night, Lord, we just want to pray, Lord God, be gone on belief. Our Savior is here. And for our relief, he will surely appear. In faith let me wrestle and he will perform. With Christ in the vessel, I smile at the storm. And so, Lord, we just pray, Lord, release that fresh spirit of faith. We pray for the next weekend. Save the lost. Restore the backsliders. Heal the sick. Revive the saints. Fill people with the Holy Spirit. And we pray, Lord, over the nation of Ireland. Lord, come and claim this nation tonight. Come and claim the 32 counties of Ireland this evening. All of it, Lord. We just repent tonight of the darkness that's in our land. Lord, the willful darkness of our land. We just come before you and we just say, God, you have every right to, Lord, just blow us out of the water. You have every right, Lord, to destroy us as a people. But, Lord, you've held back your judgment time and again. And we just call on your name tonight, Father, that, Lord, in these days there would be great harvest and revival in our land. We pray for a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit over this whole island. And that, Lord, sin would lose its appeal. That, Lord, men would lose their heart, Lord, for, right, for unrighteousness and gain a heart for righteousness. We pray tonight, Father, that, Lord, you would raise up righteous leaders in our land. Lord, we have leaders today that are a reproach to us. We have leaders today, Lord God, that aren't really fit to do the most meaningless task, let alone a ministerial job. And we come before you and we pray for them, Lord, that you give them wisdom. We pray that, Lord, if they're not the right people for those jobs, remove them and bring in the right personnel. And we pray, Lord, that you'd bring righteousness to this land again. So, Lord, we pray for your church, Lord, basically the underground church in Ireland, that, Lord, is believing for revival, that's believing for moves of the Spirit, that is building faith. And, Lord, they're waiting, as it were, for the, for the time. They're waiting for the moment. I pray that you'd keep them in purity. Keep them after you, Lord, not get distracted with other things. But, Lord, at the time of their appearing, let it be dramatic, let it be powerful, and let it be meaningful. Let them be earthed and grounded and be fit to do what you've called them to do, Lord. And that they would by no means, Lord God, be ill-prepared for that moment. And so we pray, Lord God, for righteousness again to exalt the nation. We pray for revival in the church. We pray for a quickening in our pulpits. We pray for, Lord, Holy Spirit fire to come again into our churches again. And you'll come and cleanse the land for your glory. So, Lord, seal in everything that's of you tonight. If there's any out drivel or anything I've shared that's not of you, let it be forgotten. But, Lord, we pray the night that you'll just come and take your word and, and burn it deep in our hearts. And, Lord, let it continually bear fruit within us, we pray tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen.